it's a big differentiator. And I think the organizations that figure it out, the organizations that get it right are the ones that are going to be able to attract people. And I think organizations that don't, they're going to have more of a struggle because that's something that's important as we think about just making conscious choices about how do we want to spend our days? How do we want to spend our working lives? And, and what do we want to accomplish? Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, it's Ben Eubanks. I'm really, really thrilled about today's episode. So a couple quick announcements and notes and things like that. I am thrilled that our team is gearing up for HR Summer School. And if you have not attended that in the past, it is our virtual online event we do every single summer. Started it in 2020 as a way to just bring some encouragement, some education to the to the marketplace because people just like you or many of, were stuck at home, we're stuck waiting for what's next for my HR career, for the company I'm working for, all those kind of things. And summer school was a way to meet the needs by creating a networking opportunity, creating an education opportunity, but creating an encouragement, inspiration opportunity, most of all. So if you want to learn more about that, some of the conversations, the people you hear on the podcast, some of them will be represented there and some new ones that you probably have never heard of before that you'll be glad you did. So hrsummerschool.org is where you can get more details on that and sign up if you want to attend. It's completely, totally free, 75 HRCI and term credits every year. That's our goal. All right. In addition to that, I'm going to be at Unleash in Vegas and then HR Technologies UK in the UK in the coming weeks. And so if you're going to be at the, any of those events, please ping me. Or if you want to know more about what those events are about, please ping me. I'd love to share my feedback, my input, my trip report, what you want to call it. I'd love to share back with you. And I have so much fun getting out and getting a chance to connect and hear some of the amazing stories of the companies out there that are doing great work and the leaders like you that are serving and serving well. One last thing before we get to today's discussion. I have found consistently that the best way for new people to find the podcast is for a friend like you to share an episode with them, someone they trust, bringing that to their attention. So if you hear one of these episodes, you think, oh man, Mary would love that or Dominique would really enjoy this or so-and-so, that's fine. Share it with them. Don't just stop and say, oh, they would but share the episode with them so they can listen in and then y'all can have a conversation about it. I would personally appreciate it. And you know the kind of fun stuff we share here, the kind of conversations we have. You know that they're going to get something good out of it as well. That's going to help them be better in their work. So all that stuff aside, let's dive into the conversation for today. I have a chance to talk to Mike Trusty. He's working at Fannie Mae in a role that spans across learning, talent acquisition, and more. And Mike and I chatted years ago, and I'm so excited to finally get a chance to reconnect with him and share some of his story with you here Because we're going to talk about some big things like organizational transformation, but also some of the fundamental things of how to be great in your role as a people leader. If you're ready to take some notes, I know you'll enjoy it. Now, on with the show. Hey, everyone. This is Benny Banks, your host of We're Only Human, and I'm so glad you're here with us for another conversation. I love these discussions where we dive into some of the things that are happening, things that are changing, how we're supporting and serving the workforce out there. And it's just a blast to be able to do this. Today, I have Mike Trusty with me. Mike and I had a conversation, goodness, years ago. And I told him, I promised I'd let him settle in at his new job. It's not new anymore. You'll hear in a minute, but his new job and then we'll come back together and share some stories. And so Mike, I'm so glad to have you here with me. Looking forward to a great conversation. Ben, thanks so much for having me by the podcast. You're working now at Fannie Mae, you're a learning leader. So talk a little more about for the audience, talk about who you are and what you do so we can dive in some of that good stuff in the conversation. Sure. So I joined Fannie Mae almost four years ago now, originally to head up learning, to be the chief learning officer. And then more recently, I've added a talent acquisition to my portfolio. So right now I lead both the talent acquisition and learning. Why talent acquisition and learning? That seems like a really interesting <laughs> duo of things. So probably a great story there, but usually when you hear, we, I do talent, it's also performance or something else like why not TA too? Why just do that in your do that in your bucket because you were excelling. Yeah. I've had a great I've had a great career in HR. I had a chance to do a number of different things, so it's not my first my first experience with talent acquisition. I think right now for Fannie Mae, and as I think about what I see around work and what I see going on in organizations, so much of it's about careers. 
And so much of it is about all of us trying to figure out what we want to do. And then organizations trying to figure out where is the best place to, to put us. And if we're products of our experiences, then that means we learn the different jobs that we do and we learn through more formal learning. So if there was a common denominator there, it would be career development. And that's a big piece of what we're trying to tackle at Fannie Mae these days. It's interesting you say that because one of the big stats I've called out from our hiring study last year over and over again, seven out of 10 candidates want to know about career opportunities during the hiring process, not afterwards. Don't tell me, oh, we'll discuss it, your review. No, I want to know now, using that to sift between which of these companies I want to actually accept an offer with. Yeah, it's a big differentiator. And I think the organizations that figure it out, the organizations that get it right, are the ones that are going to be able to attract people. And I think organizations that don't, they're going to have more of a struggle because that's something that's important to, if I think about myself as an employee, that's something that's important to me. Um, and it becomes more important as we think about just making conscious choices about, well, you know, how do we want to spend our days? What do we, how do we want to spend our working lives? And, and what do we want to get out of that? And what do we want to accomplish? Okay. So I want to, I want to take a step back for a second because I just joke, no writing from that, straight for the throat. I feel like you have had, and I've met you at other companies. I've seen you, your career progress, and you've had all these different roles where you've had some great successes and things. And I'd love to know something that you are proud of your team for accomplishing in your time here, four years now at Fannie Mae. What's something that your team's accomplished in that time that you're really proud of and excited to share? To answer that question, I'll have to talk a little bit about some of the things that, that we're doing at Fannie Mae. The work that we do to support the housing industry, to, to support finan housing finance, is it's very interesting work. It's very challenging work. It's incredibly technical work. And we have gone through a very robust digital transformation over the past over the past few years, really since before I joined. And that's all of the stuff that you would expect. That's our, that's your cloud migration. That's, that's agile software management. That's all of the type of stuff that you hear when you talk about working in a next gen or a current, I guess it'd be a current gen digital environment. And the stuff that's exciting is looking at a lot of the work that the team has accomplished in that space to help our organization really get the skills and the capabilities necessary for us to achieve that transformation. And so when we think about what we can do because we have more of a cloud-enabled environment, the insights that we can get, the risks, so we can better manage risk, we can we can provide better service. A lot, so much of that is enabled by technology. It's great to be able to look at those business accomplishments and then look at our learning agenda and look at what we've done. Some of it's back office stuff, new platforms, new learning experience platforms, all of that type of stuff, just to make it really easy to get learning front and center for our employees. So very proud of the platform that we built and then very proud when I look at what Fannie Mae is accomplishing, not just has accomplished, but is accomplishing present tense to be able to correlate that back to the work that we're doing in the training space. I'm, I'm encouraged to hear you talk about the bigger digital transformation and all the million variables that go into that and the people side of it a little bit, because usually the conversation is very vague and broad. Like, oh yeah, let's just transform that. Snap your fingers and we're done. And you're sitting there thinking, okay, I've got the next six months, next year, next whatever laid out in front of me as I'm figuring out how do we make this piece of that work? Okay, what about this other piece of that? Okay, how does how training fit into that bigger picture? All the different pieces of the bigger conversation. And suddenly it's someone who says, wait your magic wand and we're digital transformation. Good to go. <laughs> you're thinking, my job just got about three times harder for the next foreseeable future, essentially trying yes. to figure out how this stuff works. And any encouragement that you would give to the people out there listening in that are saying, oh, that's great, Mike, you're on the other end of that. You're still alive, but we're about to start that or we're in the middle of it. Any encouragement or anything you can share that would be helpful for those listening in? Yeah, that's a great question. When I think about that, I think what, one of the things I picked up is you come into a new role, you come into a new opportunity or your organization starts transformational journey. It's easy to focus on the immediate request in the front office stuff. And we need a great change management curricula, or we need this great leadership transformation curricula. I guess what I've found at least for myself is make sure you understand your foundation, make sure you understand your operations. And it's the classic stuff. It's the boring stuff that we do. Do you have good instructional design practices? Do you have good data management practices? Do you have good reporting practices? Do you have a good learning ecosystem? Starting to try to figure out what in-person learning looks like going forward. So do you have the right, what's your philosophy? Do you have the right, do you have the right environment to do that? That is really tough to do, particularly when you're starting the transformation, because 
people look at what you're doing and you're incredibly busy, but they don't feel like you're doing any work. But at least being on the other side of it, I think what I see is the fact that we have a good foundation, that we have a pretty solid foundation that enabled us to be successful. And that gave us some agility to, to pivot as the organization changed that I don't think we could have if we just jumped right into building and delivering courses without thinking about the, without thinking about the backup stuff. So it's not the most exciting stuff. It's not, when you think of transformation, it's probably not the first thing that comes to mind. Um, but without a solid foundation, in months into that transformation, it can get pretty rocky pretty fast. I really appreciate you going back to something. Again, it'd be really easy to say, this is the exciting, here's the headline. Here's the thing that's going to... No one's going to be celebrating the fact that your learning ops are in order and squared away. So that you, yeah. But at some point, that's, that, those, the foundation example, right? Those cracks start to be exposed when you don't prioritize that. When you don't make that, the, how you, what everything flows from, you start to realize, oh, goodness, we weren't prepared for. And you either have to fix it then or something else. And there's the analogy about changing the tire while the car's moving and whenever else, right? Yeah. So running those kind of problems. So yeah. actually hearing that piece of it, I think that's a critical part of this. And for everybody listening in, you might like, you may not be like celebrating every single little thing or excited about this next piece, but if it's building that foundation, so you're able to accomplish everything else you're trying to get to, that's what matters. Ultimately, you're shooting for that end game. You're playing a long game. Out of that. Check the tire pressure in your tread before you, before you in, st start out on your transformation journey. It'll save you the trouble of trying to change the tire while you're going 80 miles an hour. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that metaphor. I may have to steal that one. That's a good one. All okay. yours. All yours, Ben. So one of the things, you may not know this, but I have quoted you so many times since our first conversation years ago. You know, I'm talking to people about what learning needs to look like within the organization. Because you had told me way back then that an organization's learning content shouldn't just reflect who it is, but who it wants to be. Right? If we want to be a world-class organization that excels in ABC, or we want these skills to be the key depth areas for us, then we have to make sure that what we're putting in front of our people looks like that. And I just love to hear you talk a little more about your experiences of that, how you've seen that play out, any encouragement for people listening in on that piece or how that matters, because I bring it up all the time and I'd love for you to do this so I can steal some more ideas and share those out and give you full credit, of course. Time. Of course. Thanks. But the, I think it goes back to really understanding the business, really trying to make a quick reference to Fannie Mae's strategy and a lot of our work around digital transformation. So the more that you understand the business, the more you're able to make sure that your curricula matches where your organization is going. There's a lot of, there's a lot of great content. It's out there even more so probably than the time you and I, you spoke last spoke when we talked, when I talked about that, I'll just name some of the ones that are out there, but learning is a, is a big one. Skillsoft still has a lot of great content that's out there. A lot of these companies, they have really incredible content and it's getting even better as you get better instructional design tools, greater, better production tools that go in. It's just fantastic stuff. Um, but it only makes sense if you can translate it into what you're trying to do. Another silly example, if, if you show up for a football game and it turns out it's actually a soccer match, you, you might be wearing the wrong equipment. You might have the wrong, you, you have the wrong expectations. It's going to hurt. Understanding, yeah, understanding when you, when I talk about the curricula, it's the curricula, your corporate curricula just being a reflection of what's important for the organization. And for us, housing industry has to always be at the center of that because that's what we do. Housing industry, housing finance, capital markets, those type of things. Digital transformation, I talked about. Risk management, super important to Fannie Mae. So we have to have great risk content to put that together. The analytics content that goes with that. And then leadership. Leadership is absolutely critical. I personally feel it needs to be a reflection of the leaders of that organization. It has to tie back into their language and into what's important to them because that's what ties into the culture. So the closer you can get some of that content to what is most important to the business at that particular time, I think it makes it relevant. And I think it helps in all of us as employees see more into what's important in the organization in terms of my career in terms of what I should be developing in terms of those types of skills, because any of us can get access to uh, so many of those platforms today. And so we can develop in the, in those silos, but what differentiates you in a company is your ability to really translate that into something that drives success without the organization. Hopefully that makes sense.
Yeah, I love that. I'm you're pinging through some of the different data points we've had over the last two years, three years, and some of the learning research we've done that really reinforces that. And we're like, I love the vision. I love the concept there. And I'm seeing this from the lens of a learner saying, hey, I've heard them talk about this thing at the last quarterly all hands, whatever else. And suddenly I'm seeing that content reflected in that air. Oh, this they were serious. They didn't just yeah. say that and they're moving on, but they're putting those tools within my reach to be able to say, I need to start developing these things myself. I'm going to carve out some time to focus on that. And they see there's a practical way to start making that work versus this is the flavor of the month, flavor of the quarter. And then next time it'll be something else. And we're just moving and never settling on, this is who we want to be. This is what great looks like here. And this is how we're going to yeah. invest in that and invest in you as one of our people to make sure you have the right capabilities to, to back that up. That's how I'm kind of perceiving this from that perspective. Yeah, it's, it's all communicating a message with it. It's just really, it's helping people see this is what this organization feels is most important. Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. You mentioned leadership. And one of the things that kind of, kind of sticks with me is I've been watching all the, all the trends pieces in the last couple of months. New year, new list of trends. It's, I'm just the same list of trends with just a new year stamped on it. That's fine. But one of the things I'm curious about is I always like to ask people who are in the trenches, who are doing the work every day, who are leading teams. Like, what are you really focusing on? What do you think is going to be big or important this year, just in the coming 12 months even? Because as I told you before we started recording, I want this conversation to be relevant to somebody if they listen to sure. it. Sure. now or you know, because those things are ebbing and flowing and changing. Any thoughts on that front? Yeah, I like, if you check me out on LinkedIn, you'll see that I've got a, a background in psychology. So I, you always default back to the lowest common denominator in your education. And um the, in spite of all of the technical advances, in spite of all the great tools and technologies that are out there, I think when you look at whether it's the neuroscience stuff that's coming out in particular, we're still all human beings. And I think that's the thing that is, for me, becoming more timeless as, as my career progresses, as, as time goes on. Because when we think about designing effective learning, you have to remember that you're teaching a human being. And just because that human being has a, an iPhone or an Android and a, a Fitbit and an Apple Watch and all of this technology, their brain is still operating the same way that it always has. And so when we're developing content, my my team is probably sick of me hearing about their hearing say this kind of rule of three. It's back to the fundamentals of good instructional design. What is the three things that you want your participants to learn? I don't want three. I've got 17 principles that they need to cover. No, three. Yeah. The, your brain, gosh, so much good research that's out there right now that says it's not even the seven plus or minus two if you remember your gen psych and your short-term memory. It's, your brain can really get its arms wrapped around three, maybe four new concepts, and then it needs time to process. It needs time to think. And so when we think about designing training, whether it's technical training, whether it's leadership development training, it's... To me, it's gonna. It's about spacing. It's about structuring. And it's about good design principles. And I, in some ways, maybe acknowledging that a lot of the way that we learned, all of us in school, a lot of the programs that we ran, at least what, that I ran back when we had binders that came in with programs, probably weren't really designed with a human learner at the center. But now that we know this stuff, we don't have to. We don't have to commit the sins of the past. We can do a, do better work going forward. So that's that's a trend. That's, I don't know if it's a hot topic or not, but the longer I do this, the more I think that we've got some great tools, but we always have to remember there's a person, there's a human being at the center of what we're trying to do. And we have to face ourselves to what a human being can process. You can't go any faster. Yes. I think that's great encouragement because we keep being told, oh yeah, things are moving faster. Change is coming at a more frenzied pace and unprecedented and all the other buzzwords we've learned to hate. But all those things get thrown at us, we're still people. Ultimately, yeah. there's only so much we can absorb. There's only so much we can change, even if we really want to. I'll give you an example. One of the things that we saw in our mental health study is that people who went remote were more likely than any other group. Here's your psychology tidbit for the day. Were more likely than any other group in the study to say that it was a positive change. They were happy about it. Right after that, they're more likely than any other person in the study to say that they thought about quitting their job because of stress and because of yeah. associated issues. And like, even something we think is good is still a change and change is hard. The, yes. I've said for a long time about the learning profession is that your job is in some ways to change people's behaviors. And that's the hardest job there is. Ask, I'm a parent of four kids. Like it's a hard thing to do with the change behaviors. And in some cases you're having to do it, do something that, you know, change something they've done for a long period of time. Especially yeah. we're adapting a new process or we've got this new equipment or take the use case there. But 
suddenly that rec that requires a lot of effort and a lot of energy and a lot of focus to do those things. And that all that said to say, I think you're right on. Let's come back to the basics. Let's make sure we're getting those right. Let's make sure we have good design, these things in place, because otherwise it's you can't just magically hope that people are gonna now absorb it better because it's in a prettier template or now it's not PowerPoint, but it's something else where it's still one click, one slide sort of design. Yeah. It's still it's all yeah, the animation, a lot of the tools, the our instructional design team has some really incredible tools, but it, it nothing will get past the fact that. I can only learn so fast. And then after that, I'm just, I have to shut down. Oh goodness. I'm enjoying this so much. You've already given out some advice and some encouragement in this conversation today. Actually, before I ask that question, I'll ask you one more, one, one other one that sure. kind of occurred to me. Cause you talked to earlier and I didn't realize that you had crossed back over into the world of talent acquisition. A lot of the conversation today has been around talent development. And I know I'm, I mentioned at the outset, there's an element there of even how we present ourselves to candidates, right? The EVP we have as a company and how we present ourselves. If we talk about, here's your job, take it or leave it, or here's your job, but here's your path. Here's where we see you going. Here's how we're going to grow you and develop you. We're seeing in the data that that is more appealing broadly. I think it always has been. We're seeing that now. There's actually a, one of the stats that just came in our study recently that said, we said, would you rather just, if you took a job and you knew there was no career development, how much more would you expect to get paid? And yeah. some candidates are like, I expect to get paid a lot more because I'm trading off the growth for some immediate cash, essentially. And so I'd love to hear from you a little bit about, have you seen, I don't know how recently you jumped over, back over to the TA side, but in the last couple of years, that's been a more frenzy than ever. Great time to get back, Mike. Welcome. It's on, the ship's on fire and sinking. We're glad to have you grab a bucket. I'd love to hear from you though. Have, do you think that's that sort of perception from the candidate side is changing? Is it the same as it always has been, but now it's just more pressure because it's harder to find candidates there. They want that career path piece. I don't even know if that's a question necessarily. I just want to get your take on it a little bit. Tell me this it, it, Yeah, I think it's, it, it's easy to make a, make a recruiting activity, uh, a unit dimensional transaction and it's not, so it's not about, it's not about. It's not just about a salary. I'm not going to be so naive to say it's that salary doesn't factor in. Of course it does, but it's the nature of the work. It's the, how you feel about, how you feel about working for that company. And it's about the mission of that organization. It's about the culture. It's about, yeah. And it's about as the individual kind of in, sees himself going forward, how do they see themselves in that, in that organization? I don't know. I read some stuff, but I, I don't read nearly as much as I should, or I wish that I did, but. A lot of the trends that are out there, I think because you had mentioned this earlier, because the lines have gotten so blurry between a professional life and a home in the post COVID environment, a lot of what you read in the press is people talking about just a reprioritization of what's most important in their life. Is it spending time with family? Is it pursuing something creative? Is it, is it a more traditional corporate kind of career in corporate life. So being able to bring that in, I think, to the employee value proposition and say, this is what we can do. This is what it's going to be like. And I think the good organizations and hopefully I would see us as being a part of that are being more transparent about this is what we are and this is what we're not. This is what we do. This is what we don't do. And then that allows hopefully a better decision on both the part of the, the employee as well as the, as well as the company for today's job, as well as tomorrow and what they want tomorrow's job to be. There's, I don't know how scientifically sound this is, but I have seen some survey data that your Gen Z population, much less interested in a leadership track, a management track, maybe than, than, than previous generations. That's going to have an implication for leadership development, succession planning, if, if that kind of stays the course of what it is. But that's a generation that I think is maybe looking at career a little bit differently versus versus previous generations. And again, I don't, that's, I couldn't even cite the article. So I'm just thinking about different things that I've read and trends that seem to be out there. Just on the question. I think that's a but that's helpful because when I look at the data on why people quit jobs, for example, like I, I was presenting it this morning to a group in the UK. And one of the things I say, okay, everybody, look at these top two things people say to look for at work, the top two things they care about and tell me which, and I have it broken out by age group. And when you look at my age group, there are no two age groups with the same top two priorities when it comes to work. This one says work-life balance. That one says relationships. This one says compensation. That one says career development. And there's this different set of priorities. And to your point there, if we're not sharing openly if we're not transparent about that during the hiring process they're making guesses sometimes bad guesses about what we're going to yeah. bring them 
And if we're willing to commit to those things, we shouldn't hide that or expect them to assume that, or we should be clear about what we're bringing to the table more so now than ever, because it will appeal to the right type of candidate that wants to come to that company that, right? A company like Fannie Mae, this is, we do develop you. We are going to grow you. We're going to make you better tomorrow than you are today. You're already great because we're bringing you on board. Those kind of, yeah. which are fun to have. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Now that I've, now that I've pursued that rapid trail, I'm going to come back to the last question I was going to throw your way is you've given some great advice in the conversation today. You've given some insights and recommendations, things like that. I just wanted to open it up one last time. Any, anything that you've seen that's been successful, anything that you would give to your friends who are out there and either in TA or over the learning development side, it doesn't matter. They're all going to listen in. Anything that you would share that would be a helpful tidbit or something that you've seen that's been successful or helpful for you as you've been kind of leading this function for a period of time? Yeah, I think it's a career in HR. I think it's the fact that I've done a variety of different things. I'm glad that I didn't do, I'm glad that I'm, I appreciate what I do from a learning standpoint, but I'm glad that I've also had the talent acquisition experience, the talent management experience, even having briefly dabbled in some business partner experiences as well, because I think it gives me a balanced perspective and hopefully gives me a little bit more empathy for what it's like to live a day in the life as a business partner, as we're trying to, as we're trying to drive stuff in the organization, because it's until you live that perspective, it's, you can't really fully appreciate it. And I see myself as more of a specialist, a center of excellence person than, than anything else. Uh, but hopefully my, the other things that I've done have helped balance that out and have given me a better business perspective and helped me drive some, uh, some more impactful business solutions. There's a great book. I know you see you don't read as much as you should, but you get an audio book, but it's called Range. And it's all about having this diverse set of experiences make, can make you amazing at one area if you want to, if you want to. There's some great data research pulled into that. Lots of, yeah. But I've enjoyed reading that book because like I, there are days where I wake up like, well, I want to try this thing I've never done before. And yeah, but do you go really deep? Do you try to focus in one area and exclude everything else? And there's actually some good evidence that says, no, trying to exclude everything else actually makes you too narrow, too focused. And yeah. You miss out on some of the benefits of having a little bit of a touch point in other areas. Excellent. Definitely. I was going to throw one more thing at you. It occurred to me and I forgot to that question. There was a, just a comment. One of my good friends to your psychology background, please. I'm probably never let you live that one down now. One of my good <laughs> friends also has a background and she has been talking lately about renegotiating the psychological contract is how she talks about it. And I'm like, oh, that's a really cool term. Like in today's world, yeah. everybody remembers the psychological contract back in psych class, but she talked about now that it's like this renegotiation period, almost like you're sitting now at the table saying, okay, this is what I expect. This is what you expect. How can we make sure that those meet in the middle somewhere? And she's, her recommendations are for employers to be thinking about that actively. Don't leave it to chance. And yeah, guess what? When the candidate shows up to discuss the job or when your employee shows up to talk about what they want out of their career, they've already thought through it. They already have some idea of what sorts of demands they want or some sort of expectations they have. And we need to be thinking about it too. So I thought you'd appreciate that one. Definitely. It's, and you, you mentioned this earlier when you're talking about some of the, the demographic research and it changes for all of us. And I think the, whether it's COVID or other things that have happened is, is causing more, more rapid changes. And what was even for me personally, what was critical five, 10 years ago is if that was, if the same opportunity was to present itself today, I probably wouldn't have a very different decision because mm -hmm. my values have changed. What I want has changed. So I think as a HR professional, if you're not looking at, at your people and then not expecting their principles and values to change, their lives change. Now we're missing, we'd be missing something pretty significant. You're going to get surprised in probably yeah. a good way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> surprised to the downside. Mike, this has been so much fun. If someone wants to follow you, wants to connect with you, wants to learn more about the work you're doing, just stay in your circle. Is LinkedIn the best way to do that? LinkedIn is the best way. Yeah, LinkedIn is the best way. I probably don't post again. The same with reading, I probably don't post as much as I could, but I am fairly active out there. Okay. I'll make sure and get your link into the show notes so anyone can reach out. Just let Mike know, hey, you heard him on the podcast. He would be glad to connect with you there. My friend, thank you so much for spending some time with me, for sharing some words of wisdom with me and for with everybody else out there. I know they've appreciated it as well. It's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. Hey, thanks, Ben. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. To everybody else out there, hope you got some great notes from today's conversation. We'll catch you again next time on We Are Only Human. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com. 